That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Cruella. Directed by... <laughs> directed by Craig Gillespie, uh, which, uh, of course, the highly anticipated origin story of Cruella de Vil, uh, the uh, villain from Dodie Smith's 1956 novel, 101 Dalmatians, which, of course, was made into the classic Disney cartoon from 1961, and then the two uh, Glenn Close movies from the 1990s. Uh, opening uh, theatrically May 28th, 2021, at long last. The director... Gillespie, Craig Gillespie. What do we know from him? Well, his last film was I, Tanya. Oh, which I really liked. Yes, but uh, I remember uh, his first two films opened the same year in 2007, Mr. Woodcock. Do you remember that? Yes, with Sean... William Scott. William Scott. And uh, Susan Sarandon and Bailey Bob Thorne. Yeah. Uh, and Lars and the Real Girl, which I remember watching with you. Oh, with the sex puppet. Or, mm -hmm, with yeah, Ryan Gosling. That's right. Uh, Fright Night, the remake. With my friend Colin Farrell. Yes. Yes. Which I also... Watch with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a history. We do. I'm we aware. have a history. Uh, and also notably... The, a history of violence. Go ahead. The, <laughs> the United States of Terra television series with uh, Tony Collette, which I've never seen. What's this director's name again? Craig Gillespie. Oh, good job, Craig. Watch I also... Him. Watch, I'm not saying his name right oh. <laughs> I did enjoy this film as well. Okay, I... You saw it twice. I've seen it twice because I saw the press screening and then uh, I was able to... Uh, procure procure a screener so that your eyes could look at it so that I could watch it as well I have been dreading seeing this film because not that I'm so emotionally invested in Cruella de Vil but more about you know the erasure of juicy roles for older women uh, and also kind of being uh, disappointed after La La Land because I really didn't like that film even though Emma Stone before that was somebody I kind of liked um, but I I enjoyed it. Okay, I'm going to try to tell the basic story. Spoiler heavy story from the get go. There's a Baroness mm -hmm. played by Emma Thompson. Yes, the two Emmas. She's a very successful fashion designer and she lives in this big, beautiful castle overlooking the ocean. All right. She had a baby. Mm -hmm. She didn't want the baby. Mm -hmm. So she told her assistant, played by Mark Strong. Mm -hmm. His name is John. John. She told, the Baroness told John, get rid of the baby. And she meant, she meant kill it. But John didn't want to do that. So John gave the baby to one of the Baroness's housekeepers, Kathy. Catherine. Catherine. Played by Emily Beecham. And Catherine took the baby and raised it. So Catherine left working for the Baroness to raise this baby. Mm -hmm. That baby's name was Estella. So we see Estella roaming around. This is in um, the UK. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we move forward to 1964. Mm -hmm. So Estella was born in 1954. Then we go to 1964. I, like, and then we see Estella as like a, like a 10-year-old. And she appears to have like a dual personality. She's kind of like a normal little kid, like well-behaved, but then, and you know, somewhat precocious. And then is kind of like, how would you describe her alter ego? She's difficult. She's difficult. Difficult, yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't say like an evil kid, but just kind of like won't listen, bad. Wants to go her own way. Uh, and notably has hair that's black and white. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. There's a montage of little 10-year-old Estella getting in trouble at school. Like repeatedly for various things until she is expelled. But she has a friend that she has at school named... She, yeah, Estella makes a little black girlfriend named Anita... Darling. Darling. All right. More on that later. Yes. So Estella gets kicked out of school. Her mom, Catherine, says, all right, well, let's just leave this town and go to London. So they pack up their stuff and go to London. Mm -hmm. And as they're driving, little Estella, who's very, you know, observant, says, mom, why are you wearing your best dress? And she goes, oh, I have to make a pit stop. And Catherine makes a pit stop at the Baroness's compound. Hellman Hall. And tells Estella, stay in the car. This is just going to take a minute. Of, of course, Estella can't do that. Gets out of the car. Causes all kind of commotion because that night the Baroness is having a fashion show. But the reason Catherine stopped was to confront the Baroness and tell her, like, that baby you tried to chuck into the incinerator, I took her. I've been raising her for the last 10 years. You need to give me some money because we're on the struggle bus. And... 
the Baroness. So there, this conversation's occurring like outside in the garden overlooking the ocean because they're on like a tall cliff. Which is very like last year at Marion Bad looking with all of the, anyway. Sorry. Okay. The Baroness has three Dalmatians that look like they're on steroids. So while Catherine is talking to the Baroness, the Baroness uh, uses a dog whistle to call the Dalmatians and they sort of, they're chasing Estella initially, but then when the whistle's blown, they're diverted to like attack Catherine and Catherine falls over, like plunges to her death and Estella witnesses it. And believes it's her fault. And believes it's her fault because she caused the commotion and caused the dogs to run out. All right. So then we see Estella like run away and then she makes her way to London. To Regent's Park where she was headed with her mother. And she uh, spends the night, wakes up, and then sees these two boys, Jasper and Horace. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like street kids. And they immediately sort of adopt her. And then we see them like they're just out here in these streets like stealing things, whatever. Then we fast forward 10 more years mm -hmm. and we see them as young, well, as adults, like in their early 20s, I guess. And they're still stealing. Yeah, they, they're, they're accomplished grifters. Very accomplished. Part of it is that Estella is a very talented designer. So she makes costumes for them and they have these elaborate mm -hmm. um, heists or whatever. All right. One day, Jasper, who's played by Joel Fry, on, oh, it's not one day, it's Estella's birthday. He gifts her a job. So he pulls some scam to get her a job at a department store called Liberty. Liberty of London. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of like Harrods, mm -hmm. like a very fancy department store. Because he knows it's her d dream to be a designer. So she goes to work on the first day and she is not a designer. She is a housekeeper. So there's another montage of Estella, like, ha housekeeping um, and begging for an opportunity to do something in design. But it never happens. One day Estella gets drunk and makes her way to like one of the window displays and redoes it, but passes out from drinking. When she wakes up, her boss finds her. She's in trouble. But as that's happening, the Baroness shows up. The, so the boss is played by Jamie Dimitriou, okay. uh, who is styled very much with that hair looking like Christopher Lee in The Wicker Man. Yes. As Lord Summer Isle. <laughs> yes. So the Baroness is a big deal. She shows up to the department store and while they're in the middle of like, they're going to arrest uh, Estella, the Baroness says, whomever, like who did this display? Oh, her? Well, she's the only person with any creativity, gives her um, a business card and says, you have a job, show up at five o'clock tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So Estella's now working for the Baroness as a designer. Obviously, Estella knows that the Baroness, like, this this place is where her mom died. But she, for some reason, can't put two and two together that... Because like, she's always believed that it's her fault. Like, I guess she didn't notice that her, well, she, her mom was talking to the Baroness. At or, that fashion show, she was inspired by the fashion. So she's inspired... She uh, is kind of obsessed with the Baroness as a She is designer. obsessed with the Baroness, yes. So she... Oh, I just lost my train. So, um... The Baroness starts to kind of take her under her crusty, bitchy wing and starts, uh, she, one day that pendants, this necklace. Okay. Estella, her mom, Catherine had gifted um, Estella the night of the party um, a necklace and she said it was an heirloom. A family heirloom. And like, you hold on to this. Mm -hmm. But then she lost it the night her mom died because she was running from the dogs. So now Estella, adult Estella, is working for the Baroness, sees the Baroness wearing the necklace and realizes, like, I want my shit back. So her and Jasper and Horace come up with a plan, like a very elaborate plan to steal the necklace. They execute the plan poorly. Because at this point, Estella is upset that her mother, Catherine, has been called a thief by Emma Thompson. Yeah, she's already mad at Emma Thompson's, or at the Baroness. But the night that they steal the um, necklace is like a huge gala. The black and white ball. And things don't go as planned, but... Mainly because the necklace gets taken off of the Baroness, but one of the Dalmatians eats it. Mm -hmm. So that messes that up. But it's that night, Estella learns that the Baroness killed her mom because she sees the Baroness blow the dog whistle and the dogs attack. Mm -hmm. So somehow she puts that together. Well, because there's the oral cue of the sound of the whistle that she hears as well. Sure. But 
I don't know. We can get into it. I thought it was weird that she didn't associate like my, like my mom's death with this lady. Sure. And this place, but whatever. Okay. So now she realizes that um, the Baroness killed her mom and that's when things switch. Like Estella sort of cracks and goes to her alter ego, which is Cruella. So she names herself Cruella and the Deville comes from Horace um, gets a car for Cruella and it happens to be a Cadillac DeVille. Mm -hmm. So that's why Which she's is from the cartoon as well. I haven't seen the cartoon, but so now Cruella wants to kill the Baroness or at least destroy her. And she does that by um, overshadowing the Baroness. And she recruits Art. And then a really fun character is Art who is this little queer boy who works in a shop and he helps um, Corella, basically. Played by Joel McRae. Yeah, that was a fun character. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so then like 30 minutes of the film is Corella coming up with ways to upstage the Baroness, which basically means like she shows up in better gowns and pulls stunts. So that was actually the, my favorite part of the film. When, when Cruella's a stunt queen, yeah. That's yeah, Cruella's a stunt queen was very <laughs> enjoyable to watch. Yeah. Um, but things culminate with the Baroness is having her big fashion show. She's introducing a new line. A new line. And so all this time, Estella is working for the Baroness, and then Corella is out here wreaking havoc. Okay, so the centerpiece of the Baroness's um, like fashion show is this one gown Estella designed. But Estella wants to ruin the fashion show, so what she does is she makes this dress out of these beads that are actually moth cocoons, and then she pulls a stunt where all of the dresses for the fashion show, because the Baroness thinks they might be stolen, get locked into a vault. Mm -hmm. So then Corella times it so that the moths like hatch and eat all the dresses. And then when the vault door is open, everyone opened, everyone in the fashion show is like, you know, assaulted by these moths, which ruins the fashion show. And then of course, as that's happening, Corella has a big fashion show happening across the street. Like an elaborate punk. Like rock concert, which I thought was cool. Yeah, they're singing the Stooges, uh, Now I Want to Be a Dog. Okay, but then... And we're led to believe that she could have, at this point, potentially killed the Dalmatians because she has a spotted coat. That's the only reference to the coat, yes. Uh, because Bar the Baroness knows her dogs were kidnapped because Cruella wants, is waiting for one of the dogs to poop so she can get the necklace out of it. And then Cruella shows up with the Dalmatian coat. Mm -hmm. And then the Baroness says, you killed my dogs to make that coat. Mm -hmm. But she didn't. Okay. It's that night that Horace and Jasper get taken by the Baroness. So when Cruella goes back to her lair, the Baroness is there with her thugs. And she says, oh, your little two buddies are going to jail tonight for killing you. And then she ties Corella up and sets the house on fire. But Mark Strong, mm -hmm. he saves Corella. Mm -hmm. He found her necklace. Like he must have sifted. He says like he took it and had to bleach it because it was covered in dog poop. Gives it to her and says, look, if you open the necklace, there's a key. And this key opens a box. And in this box is your birth certificate. And the birth certificate says that you are the daughter of the Baroness. So you are the rightful heir to all her stuff because the dead hut, the Baron had died and gave it to her, but really it should be uh, Estella's. Okay. So the, the final stunt, because everyone thinks Cruella is dead. Mm -hmm. So she lets it be that way. Cruella knows that there's like another big party this is so long. There's yeah. another... I can't believe I'm doing this. There's another big party, and the Cruella sends all the guests a box to dress up like Cruella. So all the guests are thinking they're going to the Baroness's party to celebrate Cruella, but really Cruella's doing it as a stunt to stage Estella's death in the same fashion that her mom died. So she goes out to the same ledge, mm -hmm. has the Baroness come out, all the guests come out. The Baroness doesn't know that, pushes her over. So everyone witnesses the Baroness push Estella. Mm -hmm. But the gag with that is Estella had a parachute on <laughs> and lands safely in the ocean and somehow is able to get out of the ocean back up to the castle, fully dressed as Corella, mm -hmm. while the police are taking the Baroness away for killing Estella. 
But before that happened, Estella had signed over in her will everything to Corella Deville. So the end of the film is now Corella Deville has inherited everything the Baroness owns. The end. And then after the credits roll, we see that Corella, one of the Dalmatians, was pregnant and had puppies. So Corella sends a puppy to Anita, who is the press uh, journalist who's been covering everything. Who's been right? covering everything, and then Jacob, the Baroness's um, lawyer, Roger. Roger, the um, Baroness's lawyer. Played by Kayvon Novak. Uh, of, from that show I like uh, what we do in the shadows yes. uh, and uh, Kirby Howell Baptiste plays Anita, Anita Darling so that is setting it up wow for I spent like 14 minutes talking about you this sure movie. did uh, so that is setting it up for <laughs> the characters we're introduced to in 101 Dalmatians this uh, Roger and Anita who have the Dalmatians Perdita and Pongo I'm going to have to edit the video so that <laughs> runs like double speed. Because <laughs> people are going to be mad. Anyway, what um, did you like about this movie? Okay, so as I had mentioned, I uh, was I, I had gone in not wanting to like it, but I actually really thought Emma Stone was quite good. Uh, again, especially as Estella, who's kind of styled like Selena Kyle, a.k.a. before she's Catwoman. Um, I liked that uh, Gillespie takes pains to... During one of their grifts, she's posing as a maid in a hotel room watching Tallulah Bankhead and Hitchcock's um, Lifeboat, which if you haven't seen Lifeboat starring Tallulah Bankhead, fucking fantastic. T Tallulah Bankhead's voice and presence is kind of the inspiration for uh, Cruella de Vil. And if you read up about Tallulah Bankhead, she's crazy. Um, love it. Uh, what else? Oh, the musical selection. Really great soundtrack. I don't think all of it fit all the time. Like there's a Nina Simone... Uh, segment that doesn't really work. Um, Blondie. Blondie that doesn't quite fit. The, that's one way or another, 78. Uh, but, but other other uh, selections, I think, work really well. Um, All of the music is excellent. It just doesn't necessarily fit. Right. Yeah. It, which, that, maybe that's nitpicking. Uh, but it reminded me kind of like of how Sofia Coppola uses music, particularly in something like Marie Antoinette. Um, the... Production design and the costume design I thought were pretty good. Jenny Babin did the costume design who did uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Um, Paul Walter Hauser and Joel Fry are entertaining and established some poignancy, I think, as Horace and Jasper, but, you know, all these people are supposed to be the same age in their early 20s. Questionable. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul Walter Hauser is doing kind of the exact same thing for Gillespie, Gillespie as he did in I, Tanya, which distracted me a little bit. I did. I do like Emily Beecham, who won Best Actress in Cannes for Little Joe as the kind mother. Um, Anita Darling, played by Kirby Hall Baptiste, I also really liked her. Uh, but really, the most fantastic moments are the, the, the stunts. Yeah. Um, I think Emma Stone as Estella worked really well. I really liked her hair. So as Estella, she has sort of like a red shaggy mm -hmm. cut that looked really good. I think Corella's fashions are amazing. Um, okay, what didn't work for me? The biggest thing is I think Emma Thompson as the Baroness is so like miscast and that characterization is so... Um, it's a caricature. It's so ineffective. And just because I've been talking so much, I think... Why not pick someone who's more... I was thinking three ladies. So pick someone who's more statuesque and imposing like a Sigourney Weaver. Or pick someone who's like fly as hell. Like you can imagine her 30 years ago just being like everything. Like a Michelle Pfeiffer who would still look amazing mm -hmm. and have that presence. Or pick someone who just looks mean and awful and unique like Angelica Houston. Mm -hmm. You know, like one of those types of actors. So then you have this triangle, and Emma Thompson doesn't fit anywhere in there. She looks like just a regular ass lady in these you like interesting gowns that are a little too tight, and then she's doing this walk that I think is well. They're, so they're trying to establish this nature versus nurture thing, where Cruella at slash Estella is also mimicking this woman, but Cruella kind of has her own posture uh, character that's not like this woman, which I find interesting. Emma Thompson is a fantastic actress, obviously two-time Academy Award winner. I do like her, but uh, I, I do agree with what you're saying, but I think what the real problem is, is the script by Dana Fox and Tony McNamara, uh, who wrote The Favorites, which uh, Yorgos Lanthimos film. Uh, 
there's no shading for the Baroness. She's just an awful human being. Very so, one dimensional. It's you know like I feel like Devil Wears Prada, which this film is also aping with the fashion world and the female mentorship, is also. Miranda Priestly, played by Meryl Streep, is also a little bit over the top for me. Uh, although, you know, I know all the homosexuals, as you also acknowledge, you know, really love that uh, personification. But they allow her to be human in at least one scene. The equivalent of that is her telling uh, Estella that she, other people are obstacles and she can't let anybody get in her way. There, but this, it kind of needed to feel more, to me, what would have worked was a, a relationship like Working Girl, where, you know, uh, Catherine Parker, played by Sigourney Weaver, is manipulating Tess McGill to get what she needs and not give her any I credit. agree because it's like the Baroness is just awful. So what is, like, wh why do all these people work for her? She's so terrible. I wanted her to be kind of two-faced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, At they're, least. Because what it would have allowed is we would have been so turned around about what we think about her maybe that the final scene where she pushes... Uh, Estella over the cliff, we could have been unsure. Because the Baroness, uh, as the Baroness asks, like when they're on the ledge, she uh, the Baroness asks Estella, can I have a hug? Mm -hmm. And then Estella says, well, are right. you going to push me over? And then of course we're like, yeah, she is going to push you over. I, It just felt so basic, like that, that, that characterization. But at the same time, um, I think Emma Stone does a really good job of dancing all around in this film very entertaining there's some mm -hmm. emotional depth yeah. um even though i it does feel a little bit long at two hours and 14 minutes or so and there's when she mark strong tells her of her legacy and she goes to she has a habit of going to regent's park to talking to speak to the dead memory of Catherine emily beecham and it's kind of her saying goodbye and i and it does feel like that probably could have been excised but it, it, it allows for a dimension to show that she's turning farther and farther into the dark side i i feel like I agree the film feels long. I can't really pinpoint scenes that I think could be excised. I think why it felt long to me is every time Emma Thompson is on screen, I just felt like, ugh. Well, it's just like when she barks orders at Her Estella lunch to order. get lunch, and it's like, this is so blah. Contrived. It's, it feels contrived, and the nine-minute naps, and it, it, it needed some more fine-tuning because uh, a lot of these roles for older women, these harpies, are so one-dimensional that they're caricature, which I don't, I haven't watched the Glenn Close version in a while, who I think was executive produced this, but I don't remember feeling that way about her, uh, but we could see a person like Emma Stone's version becoming that. Uh, I was, the makeup it, uh, as Cruella does seem a little garish and off-putting sometimes, uh, like she's, it uh, unfortunately, is reminiscent of Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie. Yeah, I wish, because I think Estella looks better than Cruella. Sure. And I wanted it to be the opposite. I will say, though, on uh, Emma Stone's last scene as Cruella, when she goes to now the newly anointed Hell Hall, uh, she's giving me... I know, like, Tulula Bankhead's the impetus, but her kind of little growl as Cruella, and she's finally kind of evened out a bit, very Elizabeth Scott to me. And if, if anybody ever makes an Elizabeth Scott biopic i think emma stone would be a shoe in um either way i mean or anyway i would i would recommend this movie i did enjoy it i probably would watch it again the cgi of the dogs oh yeah i mean that's a little nitpicky i guess but well it's just like those they are cartoonish those roided out dalmatians like they look like dalmatians with pit bull bodies might yeah. as well have been cerberus um uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> that the uh, suspension of uh, disbelief here. Uh, and also, you know, it, I like that they created this trauma over Dalmatian specifically based on what we know about who Cruella de Vil becomes as someone who wants to make a, a coat out of some, some puppies. Uh, but it just makes it seem like Disney's not really ever going to go there. However, as an origin story for a villain, to me this is miles away better than Maleficent. And at least allowing some of that darkness to remain. Sure. What would you give this film? And also Paul Walter Hauser in drag looked like John Candy in Nothing But Trouble. Drag. Oh, I really liked his character. He's, he's really cute. <laughs> he's cute, but he's always the same. Like, he's always the same. He's even... Well, I don't know him in anything else, so to me he seemed fresh. But you, you've seen I, Tanya. He's in that? Yeah. Oh, he's the... Yeah, the thug. Mm -hmm. uh, and I liked Wink. His little... Chihuahua with one eye. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, th there are key, and he does score key mode. Anyway, what would I give it? Uh, I think three and a half out of five is fair because I feel like if we're going to be redoing everything, I would like it to veer towards this level at least. I would give it three and a half oh, out of the, five as well. Sorry. The... Uh, it looks it's beautifully shot in some scenes um, when we first go into Liberty of London no you have to that's, a, that's, that's like a, Patti LaBelle saying Diana Ross is talented sometimes <laughs> you said it has seen like some no but, well because it has some rocky ones as well but uh, Nicholas uh, Karakatsanis, who Michael R. Roskam has used a lot, like in Bullhead and The Drop, which those are films that I definitely recommend. Um, that scene where we first go into Liberty of London and the, the long tracking shot, I thought that looked great. Uh, but then the parachute scene in the end looks choppy. Like, it looks really CGI, like that should have been edited a little better. But uh, overall, I think it's a pretty impressively shot film for a CGI heavy endeavor. Okay. All done? Yeah, sorry. All right, bye. Bye. Thank you.